Um, all right. So, so there are different ways to engage your body, right? So, so part of the things you and I as students have to learn from subtlety, right? We don't get to have as much access to, to the doing of all the poses, right? So whereas another student that doesn't have the same altered mind-body relationships that maybe most of us do can, and actually it makes them a slower student in some ways too, but they, they do, 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 and maybe the 75th thousandth time they try something, they all of a sudden, their mind wakes up, right? But you and I have to learn from more subtlety. And one of the things that I, and that's why, I mean, this class may work and it may end off in the weeds. So just let's go on an adventure here because I'm not exactly sure if I'm going to be able to communicate this stuff, right? A lot because I don't, you know, I'm still working on it. But so... um so like the how we engage our body. So for me as a student, when I try to show you and one of my teaching styles is to, is to take a line that I've been ruminating on and turning over, over and over for often three decades. And I still learn things from it. Right. And I, I'm hoping, and, and that, and that's part of as an adaptive student, I think that we don't get to default too quickly to the performance of the pose. We actually have to like keep open, keep open and learn more from less. And, but once that starts to pivot, then the more we learn, I think is, is bigger, is wider, right? So for me, there are certain lines that I try to, that I've, ruminate on that I pass on to you, right? And and that I'm still in the process. It's 32, I started in 91. So 32 years later, and I'm still like turning some of them over. But I wanna get like, so today I wanna like try to like blow life into a distinction um, and a word, a change of wording that I'd heard a few years ago um, and I watched the video again late last night and, and it's got me thinking again and slightly differently, but like, for example, you know, so if you sit up straight and tall, we're not going to fully start yet, but here would be an example of a line that changed me. So often I actually pass on to you signposts of instructions that I've heard that I could tell at the time. And this is what I wanna um, invoke in you as students is that is when you have an instruction or a line that all of a sudden you can feel and it may not even be at the time you can feel has truth to it. You don't know what it is, but you stick with it over like years that's the kind of student I want you to be, right? That all of a sudden you go, oh, something's going on in that line. I'm not quite ready for it, but there's something for me to learn. One for me that has happened about, I don't know, probably 12 years ago now, was instead of just lifting the chest, everyone lift your chest. And as we know, you know, I'm, continually trying to point out to you that perhaps this is the most integrated part of human consciousness is in the center of the chest, that this part of the spine has something really important to it. And when this is collapsed, your relationship to the world outside of you is transformed. When it's lifted, the overall sensation of your being is changed, right? So I've been trying to say, oh, don't just think about lifting your chest too fast something really important is happening. But how you engage to lift your chest is where asana comes in, right? The things you do in order to do something. 
so here's an example of an instruction, not the one I'm going to try to build the class around is that instead of just lifting the chest, the tendency when you go to lift your chest, think before you're a yoga student, you tell someone out on the street to lift their chest and they go just from the chest. They don't ground their base. They don't ground their thing. Right. And the tendency even for, for a more um, advanced for a, a, even for a yoga student for a long time is they tend to lift more of the front side of their body than the back of their body. Right. So they think about the front side because that's the easiest part. That's the part where mental awareness is more cued to the eyes. And so the front side of the body is easier to do with than the back side of the body. Right. So in order to get the back side of the body in poses, you actually have to do a version of, I don't know, surrender, opening, subtlety you have to soften down the inside of your mouth all, all these things right so when you lift the front side of your body to lift your chest you, you know like a, a beginning instruction you'd give to a beginning student would be lift under your collarbones for example right because that's a that's that takes fire to do right you kind of go like oh, okay i get that that's quick there's a feedback loop it's quick but if you try to say no, when you lift the front side of your chest, you have to balance it with the back side of your sternum. All of a sudden, you have to go inward, right? How do you, instead of feel the skin on the front of the chest, how do you coordinate it and integrate it with the awareness of the skin on the back of your sternum, on the back of your, on your back? And how do you bring them into balance? That's going to be pratyahara. That's one of the limbs of yoga. You're going to have to go inward. Now, I really like if if uh, Patricia were on the cover, I don't think she's here, I would be, she'd want to go, the backside of the sternum, I just have to imagine it. No, it's not imagination, right? That, that remember the framework, the conceptual framework we work within, imagination and physical, those are all just words on our experience. Right. So you're not just imagining. So when I say open to the room behind you, if you, after all these years, are just doing that mentally, you're missing what I'm teaching. Right. Is that there's a way to open to the open to what's behind you, such that when you lift what's in front of you, more awareness of what's behind you comes into the lift. Okay, stay patient here, everybody, because I'm just doing it on the side, right? So, so it's like the the balance all of a sudden introduces balance. I have to be more way more aware. So the line from Laura Blakeney was instead of lift your chest, let the upper thoracic migrate forward. What? You should for me, that's a critical line. All of a sudden I went, oh, I don't have to use so much will. Instead of just trying to open to this abstract thing of what's behind me and make sure there's this subtle balance between the front and the back body, she says it in one phrase, let your upper thoracic, don't lift your chest, let your upper thoracic migrate forward, which is a completely, in order to do that at that subtle level, can't you tell you already have to ground? You have to get quiet. You have to soften your jaw. You can't do that. Let your upper thoracic migrate forward in any kind of real way and clench your jaw. You actually have to practice a whole bunch of other things. It's an unbelievable line. How do you migrate the upper thoracic forward and get a feeling that's similar to when you open a window and get fresh air? Right? Like, how do you do it differently instead of just, oh, I'm just going to lift my chest? Like, wait, you mean lifting my chest can feel like opening up a window in a dank room? Yeah, I think so. So there are instructions that, that there's one for me. So this class is going to be about a different one that's going to be even harder. At least it was for me. Um, 
you know, so, uh, all right. So, and Hey, have you ever, um, when you actually try to lift the back bite at the front by let your upper thoracic migrate forward, don't do it too much. Your will actually keep your jaw soft, your eyes soft, all those things. Um, doesn't it seem easier to lift your chest? Does anyone, will someone nod for me, please? God, God, please be with me, right? So there's a really, really, really important line from the Yoga Sutras. When effortful effort becomes effortless, you've encountered the fourth method of pranayama, of breathing. How does effortful effort become effortless? And that's going to be how Shavasana is in every pose, right? There's a whole bunch of things I've been saying for a long time. So let's, let's center for a second. So again, let something drop. I've been trying to give you these abstract things, right? What I love about Iyengar yoga, and I'm not, is that you and I have to learn from subtlety, but it's amazing there are physical ways to do things too. And that makes me believe that it's not just my mental imagination. There are possibilities of self that I have not made manifest into my alertness. Right? There's possibilities of self that don't require judgment, that don't require ego, but I have to receive them. I don't get to control them. So soften your temples, the jaw, the inside of your mouth. Start the, the flow of emptiness. Be so grateful that you get to have movement and not just get lost in the emptiness, right? Minds alone will get derailed in the emptiness. We need the body. Otherwise, it accelerates us towards self-destruction, right? So soften the organs of perception. Let there be the quiet and the drop, and then lift the chest by migrating the upper thoracic forward, opening, opening to what's behind you, integrating it into action. When you do it that way, doesn't it become less violent? The quality of it, it's different. But now we need to add more movement down with your sitting bones from the inner groin to the inner knee to the inner heel. As that happens, watch your energy of your spine extend upward, down to go up. Now it's a good time to inhale with the up. Because so I'm going to ask you to go horizontal now. Right, broaden between the shoulder blades. Anchor that to lift under the collar bones. Extend from the inner groin down to the inner knee to the inner heel. More, more, more. There's more here. I just have to get in the position to receive it. It was always here. Resop in the jaw, the inside of your mouth. Stay alert. So more of the potential of self can come through your vessel. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga.
as the mind wanes and starts to look for the next thing, repose. Always the next thing for the mind. Good, and then release, and then from the ground, lift your sternum. So from the ground, your tailbone up your spine to your sternum. As you start to lift your sternum, feel the skin drop between your shoulder blades. Broaden it and drop your chin. The feeling of dropping your chin will have different sensation if you're broadening between your shoulder blades. There'll be the potential of Uddiyata Bandha in Jadahara Bandha. Breath into each nostril into each lung, awareness of each sitting bone, and of each heel. It is both experientially true that your breath touches everything at once, but it literally does it through the oxygenation of your blood. Our vascular system is amazing. Everything touches everything. Raise your head up with closed eyes. Open your eyes. So the idea that there's instructions that are um are making you engage subtlety is a hard thing. I hope that I hope I was able to get some life into migrating the upper thoracic and the balance that it has and all the things that have to be true. Right? You don't get to just reach into the universe and pull one part. You have to actually have the whole thing come with. The mind actually thinks it's more in control. All right. So an effortful effort becomes effortless. So for traditional students more, um, but they don't have the time get it because they get caught up in accomplishment. One of the functions of inversions is to show you that your consciousness can float within your body. This is my words now, right? So like, so I talked to you before about the joints hovering. You know, so like joint awareness is something you want to, you want to teach. That's what standing poses are for, right? One of the reasons is that you're trying to synchronize the movements of joints. So right now, and please, God, I hope you believe it's more than your imagination because don't limit yourself like that, right? Find where your joints are. Huh? Center of your joints. Don't flex a muscle. Center of your joints. Where are I'm paralyzed? What the hell? What do you mean the center of my ankle? What are you talking about? What do you mean the center of me? Do you mean there's a difference between my ankles and my knees? Absolutely. Do it. Where are your hips? Find the center of them. I have a harder time to find the center of my shoulders because of my turn rotator cuffs. I have a harder time. There's so much muscular tension around my elbows. So much like I have, I have lots of impingement there. Right. And then to my wrists, holy cow. I'm so gunked up in my wrists because of how they broke. 
right? And then wait, I've got joints on each of my fingers. Are you kidding me? There are joints everywhere. My head's a joint. Find the joints. The center of your joints are buoyant. So how would you make yourself lighter? I want to teach this to patients in hospitals, right? Is that when you're lifted, there's a way to make yourself lighter rather than heavier. So if, you, if I were to ask you, like, make yourself lighter right now, what would you do? How would you do that? And on one level, this is impossible, right? Because the mind's going to, your mass is constant and. So do you think you're heavier or drop your chest? Are you heavier or lighter? Right? <laughs> Lift your chest and transform the distribution of your presence. Find in that lighter feeling, find where the center of your joints would be. When effortful effort becomes effortless. Take a couple of breaths. More of you breathe than your lungs. And then make yourself heavier again. So like I got my forearms on the table and I can definitely let there be more weight onto the table. I can surrender like a sack of potatoes. And this is not particularly nourishing. Now I'm going to figure out a way to have just and come up and lift my chest a little bit so the table becomes nourishing to support my weight. We should be doing this in our chairs way more than we are. We should be figuring out how to utilize the support of our chairs instead of just letting them be you flopping heavy into your chair. We've started inversions now. We're trying to figure out how to have that lighter feeling without effort. Good, and then release. All right, we better move around a little bit because holy cow, what are we doing, All right? But why? So what's the relationship to moving around a little bit and that sense of lightness that's in the emptiness, right? Right, so... This sense of space. What if the empty space helps hold you up? Right? That its connection to everything at once is part of what is possible here. Right? So I'm going to start waking up some muscles, right? Getting certain spaces open. My intercostal muscles matter. Right, especially if I'm going to try to hover in my joints, if I'm going to try to move energy from head to feet rather than upward from feet to head. Right, and so I'm even going to try to get some rhythm. I need to wake up my legs, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to get my legs kind of like way. I want my whole body here. So I'm going to, I'm lifting the knee. So whatever you can do, try to get your legs part of this practice. We were just super heady, right? So I'm just going to bring one up. Even if you can't do something to make your legs move. So your brain starts to get input from a different part of your body. So I'm jiggling a little bit. So I'm just kind of feeling, getting lighter. Now I'm gonna put some of this space and lightness to work in some version of downward facing dog. So I'm gonna come forward onto my table. I'm gonna make sure, I want you to pay extra attention to the length in your low back and broadening across the sacrum, right? <clears throat> and I want you to do that as, and as you, as you, Feel the space in your back, broaden across your sacrum and push down through your sitting bones. I hope to God you'd notice your chest just lifted. 
right? That a different way of lifting your chest just occurred. That's crazy. And it's really exciting that things like this are true. And then if I add the movement of my breath, the inhalation, the expansion of the intercostal muscles, and as soon as I feel more consciously my inhalation moving my ribs, I don't know about you, but I start to feel my legs differently. But I feel the space in my legs, not the control of my legs. You mean ribs and legs and energy and prana are all connected yeah actually that's for sure true all right and then lift up hang be in traction and even if you can't lift just Go up enough, but pay enough attention to what's on the base so you feel a sense of traction. Now sit back down and keep that sense of traction and make sure it feeds into the center of your chest. Right? So now when I lift my chest, I'm integrating with, with space in my low back. So I'm rocking back and forth right now. So I want to keep this energy alive. Right? <clears throat> and now I'm going to keep that energy alive and I'm going to put pressure on my knees. Right? Because I want to get that space in my back, the lift in my chest, and a sense of my legs. Now, those of you that are lucky enough to feel the skin on your feet, Make it go to your feet too. Good. And then release. Because by the time I start doing inversions and I start moving energy this way, right? I want the empty space in me to actually be the conduit of the inversion. So right now I'm practicing weird stuff. Like I'm having fun doing this in front of you right now. I'm like moving my hand and letting the movement move through the center, the emptiness in my body, right? I'm making connections. So that can start by actually feeling that you're swimming in the cosmic soup, but I'm making sure that my movement, my rhythm change, and the movement of my arm starts to reflect like a shadow traveling through my legs, right? And do it the other way. It's like, I'm trying to get more unified here. Remember, the way that my hand moves through the center of my legs and through my spine is like the shadow coming from the fifth dimension to the third dimension, or the third dimension coming to the second dimension. That's a reference to a class that if you remember time travel, like you've got to let things, not imagine things, you have to let things integrate. They're already integrated, right? And then if I want to control it, I'm going to put my hands at my sides. I'm going to stretch my arms down. This is a typical beginning of Tadasana. It's all this rigidity, right? Can you let the tricep or let's, whether you can do the muscular or not, have the, have the tricep and the bicep. Sque so squeeze your upper arm, boom, right? Whatever you do to squeeze that. Right, and then open your palms and spread your fingers down. Right, and as you do that, ground your legs. So, as you open your palms and put attention through your arms, you're using it to go down through your legs. Now, inhale and feel the intercostal muscles of your rib cage. Good, and then release. So that, as soon as I become static like that and more muscularly controlled, because I want to have fun, family, I want to move it again, because I don't want to get caught being too willful with this space, right? Because I know when I'm willful, I introduce my judging mind. 
right? I introduce too much, too much baggage. So I'm going over to the side again. Right? I'm going over this way again, right? Because I want this one going into traction. Oh, so finally the line that I've been thinking about that this class is going to go around, right? And it, it's about shirsasana. I watched it last night, but it's about every movement. So one of the easy ways, so everyone, now it's hard once you've been doing a yoga class to do something really without integration, but just take your arm up quick, right? Like kind of, you know, without, try not to be a yogi for a second, right? And just do it and watch how, when you do it without thinking, it's just your muscles that do it. Right, like they just quick fire, and that's that's kind of how a lot of people and I often live my life, right? So biggest anger was talking about the setup in Shirsasana here, right? With his arms over. And if you can do that, can we? You can also do it on your lap. <clears throat> so so a couple things that he was pointing out that that was really interesting. So this is gonna be subtle, right? If you can, you know, there's a place on your forearm, right, where there's a the bone there, that 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 bone that's your, you know, your forearm. There's a little place on your elbow, on your forearm, where it kind of sticks out just subtly, right? Just a little bit. And so, and even if you don't get it right, who cares? But there's a little point where there's, right? So, okay, so he's having every, I just can't believe what the guy knows. I just can't stand it. Okay, so so he's saying you got it, that has to push him to the floor. But what he was trying to point out is when you push in on that bone, however you do it, right? Push in on that bone. It makes space at the head of your bicep. Okay, so, and it does something to my neck because my neck is really compressed, right? But so again, even if you have to just uh, just trust, push in on your forearm and make a connection to right there. And whatever the connection is, it's actually spaciousness which is gonna be really important not to let this collapse when you're in Shirsasana. So again, push. And it's like, oh my goodness. So when he says space, I kind of feel it as almost a relief and an emptiness right at a place I didn't expect. Now I gotta do it on the other side. Oh, so that one I really feel, right? So I'm pushing on that bone. And it's like, oh, I don't know, but doesn't it make this feel like it's safe or something in here, right? And it's like that he wants to be a crucial part of the, of the, of the headstand, right? Of the base. So you're figuring out so if you can put your hands on your thigh, your forearms on your thighs or on a table, right? And you try to get that. Now, you know, when I do it on my thighs, I can't push on my legs as hard, but I just felt it when I did it this way. So I'm making it happen just from that reference. So I'm getting that, that connection and that feeling of length and space here. But once you get that space, do you feel how it transforms between your shoulder blades? Can you nod with me or am I over your head now? Yeah, okay. That's gonna open the conduit to your legs. What? Okay, so now when you, when you feel this space to here from your forearm, damn it. 
Then he says, and then, he, of course, this is the next step. Damn it. I can't believe that I wouldn't have got this. But, right, when you do that, it's not just the space on the bicep. There's an integration with your tricep. Try it again. There is a, so like David, it'd be interesting because it's not muscular yet. Right, it's actually a movement towards the bone of the back of the arm, but it's not a movement in a physical sense. It's like all of a sudden it centers through the bone, right? And then I'm gonna do it this. So I'm now connecting here with the bone, right? I'm feeling the space here and getting the, natural kind of energetic lift towards the bone on the back of the arm. And when that all integrates, does, oh my God, see like it's getting so loud because I'm seeing what he's trying to show. I can feel my legs, right? Something's happening here, right? And then release. So his complaint and he's barking is that, when you all take your arms up over your head, and if you can do this, do this. You can even do it on your thighs, though, right? When you take your arms up over your head, and I ask you to bring your, your elbows together, he was barking at everyone going, you do it just with your muscles. You just kind of stupidly, kind of like you take your arm up fast, right? You just kind of quickly move on the outer body. And, and he goes... That is so not effortful effort becoming effortless. These are my words now, right? So then here's his instruction that I remember hearing about five years ago, and I'm now like back. It lit my brain again last night. The instruction is, so take your head and hands down. <laughs> so, I don't know why. But this word really works for me. He's going to use the word entwine. Right? And I don't mean with my hands. I'm trying to show you, like, to me, like, if you get something to connect and integrate together, like a tapestry, right, it entwines. Okay? So he was trying to say about Shirsasana but this is going to be about every pose, right? That you need to move more from the skin and less from the muscle. So instead, the quick thing for the brain to do is to grab muscles, to go, right? And when I do it just from my muscles, it's here. It's, it's this kind of gross feeling, right? So his instruction, and, and this would be even when you put your hands together, when you lean on the table or on your thighs, right? The tendency is to go first to the muscle. Remember, asana and the realization of self, asana is going to teach the realization of self because how you engage your potential transforms. So his instruction is, so remember this, I know complicated. We got the bone, the space, the tricep. He says, entwine the skin of the forearm, the bicep head, and the tricep. So don't do it just by action. Right? Try to get the places. So what would happen if you did it from your skin and not your muscles? Try again. Right? And here's the kicker. So I'm having all these threads come into me from last night. In another place, he says, intelligence enters the poses through the skin. Muscular control is like primitive dumbness. Right? So now try to like connect that bone coming in, as soon as I get this bone to move in, I find earth, right? Then if I connect the skin, not just the muscles, 
of the skin on my forearm, the space near my bicep and my tricep. I feel, does anyone, can anyone, is this too weird? Can you feel your legs? Yeah. That's prana. That's prana without, without having to see it as pure muscular action. And now, when, if you're able to interlock your fingers, doesn't it make sense now why you'd want to engage the webbing of the skin this way? Right, because actually that starts to get the muscles, but you're holding off and not just, you're trying to resist your brain going right to the muscles. You're trying to see this in terms of skin. And when you see it in terms of skin, I feel breathing in my legs. It and then release. So I did this forward here because when I'm learning something subtle, I want it to be simpler because I know it's going to get harder with my arms over my head. Right? Because now I got balance issues. I got all this extra bullshit, right? So my, my awareness on the depth of what's being told is compromised because I'm battling for balance. Okay, but now I'm actually going to bring and try to get, not just squeeze my hands together, not just do whatever you're doing here, not just engage the muscles, but I'm going to try to hold off and go feel the skin of this, this, this. And as I pressurize between my hands, when I'm engaged at this level, I get my legs better. Breathe. Good, and then release. So over your head makes it more dramatic. Now I want everybody to try to do it on their lap. Okay, because this is the setup. If you were if you were doing a traditional um shirsasana headstand, you'd be on your hands and knees and you place your hands like this. Right. And so this would be the floor where they are on your knees or if you're on a table. <clears throat> and you would kick up, but it's so if you kick up and think it's off, if, if you, so let's talk about an inversion for a second. So in a traditional pose, right? In a more able-bodied pose, whatever that is, right? There's all this drama about kicking up and, and getting upright and all this fear. And so the tendency is to get too muscular, right? You end up firing and holding and gripping, right? But really what you need to do is when you kick up, you need to right away activate this part that we're working on to help you come up more and more gracefully, right? So come forward again. Now we're just not going to kick up. Right, but we're going to get, so now as I'm here and I've got my forearms and I try to get my forearm, the bones to come in, which makes me practice extraordinary pratyahara to pull inward. And when I lift my forearms up, or whatever that means, the center of my chest actually opens, right? And so now I'm going to entwine the skin from on my forearms, my bicep head and my tricep, increase the pressure between the webbings of my fingers or between my hands and hit down through my sitting bones from the inner groin to the inner knee down to the inner heel. 
but I'm trying to do it from the skin and not just from the muscle. Breathe. And then release your fingers, your hands, and see how everything changes. Right? So just by unclasping my hands or unconnecting my hands, the whole pose goes away without changing this. So I'm going to do it again. So now when I come in this time, right, I'm going to try to have everything happen like I'm kicking up in one fluid motion. Just try whatever you got today. I know this is a hard class, right? Engage it all the way through. See it. Make sure now you're drop. So you're getting all this connection through your to your legs from your arms, right? So now release again and watch it all change. So one of the ways that people screw up in headstand is they they compress their neck. Right, they take too much weight on their head. So we're doing this backwards now. So we're doing all this other stuff to get a connection to the legs. And then the next instruction is gonna be when you got it all connected down to your legs from your hands through your arms to your legs. I want you to lengthen the top of your head and lengthen your neck, okay? So let's do it again, right? So. I'm I'm thinking about my forearms. I'm but now hopefully you don't have to think at all. You can kind of just do it because the sequence has got you in like having sensations, right? And bring it all together, find the legs, engage, increase the pressure between the hands to make the pose more whole. Now make sure your neck is long and the shoulder blades are moving away from it. So my spine is staying sturdy as the energy goes from my head to my legs. So although your neck is lengthening, it's to get a deeper sensation to your legs. Breathe. Good, and then release. So now it's going to get more complicated, right? We have to go with the hands over the head now if you want to if you want to do the same thing we just did there do that i think that's for me that's probably a better inversion but if i want to be like everybody else right all those traditional students but i got to figure out my balance here so now i'm going to figure out how to do all of it lengthen my neck so the great thing when i have my hand i can kind of pull my protraction on my own neck but remember i'm doing all this work to get down to my legs right don't just squeeze your arms open your arms to feel your legs does the exhalation help you extend through your legs I hope so. Dave, I like that you do it one arm at a time. It's smarter. In fact, I want to do that. I'm going to do it one arm at a time because I'm off balance. So if you're off balance, do one arm at a time. So I'm moving from my skin to the prana because that's where my intelligence is. Now, and then I'm gonna release. Remember the joints have to float. So I'm doing it all again. And I'm finding the relief in the emptiness of my joints. And using that to find effortful effort without effortless. When effortful effort becomes effortless. So I'm doing all this work. I'm gonna go to the first set again, but it's to create a sensation of effortlessness or floating. All the while, moving energy from my head to my feet. 
Oh, I like this one. I've got it good on this one. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back to the other side. A lot of congestion in my right shoulder. Hmm. And then just because I feel like I should visit all of them, I'm gonna do it with two hands again. But this won't, this feels heavier. Like I'm a sack of potatoes. Good, and then release. Mm. Take your arms behind your back. I'm grabbing the outside of my, inside of my wheels. I'm just gonna open my chest here. All right, I'm gonna broaden because I'm pulling. All right. Then I'm gonna lift the center of my sternum and drop my chin while lifting my sternum up. And as I do this, I'm gonna hit through my sitting bones and down to my inner heel, shoulder stand. Good, and then release, we're gonna do it one more time. Remember, when we try to lift the sternum, try to let it migrate. Arms behind you again. Broaden. Lift the sternum, but let it migrate. So I got to remember that. And then take my head down. Down through the sitting bones. Inner groin, inner knee, inner heel. Good, and then release. Inhale up. Everything goes down. Right, this was to go down. Not just to go up. Exhale. Grab behind you. Make sure you stay on balance so I'm grabbing my knee instead. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. All right. Gonna come back to center. Down, even though I'm going up. Exhale, down. Lift the chest and aspire with your spine, not your head. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. And then come on back to center. Like a net or a web, come back to a neutral position. However you do it. From a real deep sense of quiet. In visit the class, the headstand part of the class. Like try to make it happen without much effort. Bone in, space at the bicep. Tricep, but then entwine the skin. And as you invoke your intelligence to not do what's easy, notice how that opens your legs. Now use Shavasana to float in your joints for a second, but stay active in the pose. Visit the pose without as much effort. Breathe. Good, and then release. 
feel some symmetry, right? <clears throat> each foot, each sitting bone, each lung, each side of the bed, right? Because we're about to have to receive the chair. Because you want to get in a shavasana. So I want my sensitivity. So um, without trying to be too aware of your skin, you want this sensitivity that's the part of your consciousness that's more connected to your skin. So there's the surrendering to the support of the chair, but you want the, the sensitivity of the skin. So that's why I touch my thumb tips typically and lightly have my hands together because I want my skin, that part of my consciousness to actually receive the support of the chair, of the floor, if you're lying down. Soften around the temples, the jaw, the inside of the mouth. Lips together, teeth slightly apart. The hum in the joints is part of what keeps you up in an inversion. Feel your breath. It's nice to be organic. Let there be movement. Thank your body. It solves a problem your mind could never solve. Sustains life. The mind can protect life. Can't sustain it. So think it again. The body. 
start to bring yourself back. Slightly deeper inhalation. Slightly un longer exhalation. I hope some of the time when you come back from Shavasana, you don't just re regret the world of effort, which we have to live in all the time, but it kind of makes you smile. Not the effort, fact that there's more and that it was always true those next couple of breaths I hope you can let it touch your entire body and it connects you to the home And then the exhalation gives it direction. It's kind of miraculous, actually. All right. Hands together. Namaste. Spirit in me bows the spirit in you. I'll definitely stay on it. I got to imagine that might not have been the easiest class. Lots of buildup for what? Wait, that's the payoff? Entwining the skin? Shit. Dare you to start practicing it. Right? Like, I'm doing it right now. I'm doing the whole class right now. You should practice stuff like that today. Do the whole class in five seconds. Just don't be in a rush. <laughs>